Because just because of the Metro Metro gets all the money, like we direct federal money to Okay, folks, it's uh, just a touch after seven, so I want to get the meeting started. And uh, I had a last minute addition to the uh, agenda, and that's uh, Mr. Mark Creevy. And he's going to give us a three to five minute update on what's going on with uh, uh, the Beaverton School District levy. And uh, it's kind of funny because uh, he uh, works for a company I used to work for, and it was just kind of odd to see him pop up. But uh, <laughs> he's a cool guy. And Mark, would you take it away and give us a pitch on uh, what's going on with the levy? I will do that. Thank you. I will not take a lot of time. I know you've got a full agenda. Um, the only reason I'm here is because I have a daughter in the Beaverton Public School System. So I'm a parent volunteer coming to speak to you, uh, along with other groups over the last few weeks, to talk about what's going on in the Beaverton School District and the challenges facing the Beaverton School District in terms of revenue, or lack thereof, I guess you could say. You may or may not be aware there's a levy on the ballot, that you'll be receiving your ballots here in a couple weeks. So I'm here to give you a brief rundown on that levy and why it's so important. My usual chat is, is longer than I have allocated. So what I decided to do, I was fortunate enough to come across the editorial in the Beaverton Valley Times today uh, in support of the levy. And I read through it, and uh, it hits the points that I typically hit. So if you'll allow me, I would like to read through that. That's all right. To fully appreciate the need for passage of a local option levy for the Beaverton School District, you have to consider just how deeply the district has cut in the past five years. During that period of time, which includes the devastating effects of the Great Recession, Beaverton schools have eliminated $142 million in expenses, lost 640 teaching positions, and cut 16 school days. We have a wide demographic here, but I think back to my grade school, middle school, and high school days in Sacramento in the 60s and 70s. And uh, I would ask you to think back to that time as well and think about your typical class size. Um, class sizes in the district now routinely reach into the 30s and 40s and many children are not getting the attention they need to succeed. My daughter's a sixth grader at ACMA, the Beaverton Arts and Communication Magnet Academy. Um, if you can imagine a classroom full of 45 sixth graders, you might uh, conclude that there may not be a lot of teaching and a lot of learning going on in a class like that. Um, it's basically crowd control and much of the teaching that is going on, what they're calling teaching, is handing out worksheets uh, for the kids to complete. Um, the teachers are overwhelmed. Uh, uh, the kids who don't have attentive parents at home who are asking about what's going on and helping are, are falling through the cracks in terms of education. Before it was forced to deal with these reductions in state funding, Beaverton schools always had been a point of community pride, attracting families to the area, keeping home values high, and providing abundant educational opportunities for students. Today, the, those assets are placed at risk, even as the state is, in a, uh, is finally in a position to begin rebuilding funding for schools. The local option levy that appears on the May 21st ballot will keep the school district from having to make additional cuts. Passage of the levy would cost $1.25 per thousand of assessed value, or about $24 per month for the typical homeowner. That's a significant request, but it's a necessary one for residents who want to protect community livability 
while also placing a safety net beneath their schools. The five-year levy will raise 15 million per year, enough for the district to make some progress in hiring back teachers and reducing the most extreme class sizes. Without the levy, the district will face even more cuts because projected state funding will leave it five million short of what's needed to maintain current programs. If the levy does not pass, we know, best case scenario, what, what they're talking about in Salem, for Beaverton Public Schools, we will see more teacher cuts, uh, compounding an already very difficult situation. The students enrolled in Beaverton Schools today will suffer ed educational harm if they continue to endure another round of reductions and the resulting increase in class sizes. The district has done its best to curtail expenses in other areas, such as administration. Beaverton has the lowest cost per student for admin in the state of Oregon. We are running at the lowest, just to reiterate that, the lowest cost per student. We have, the Beaverton School District has done an excellent job of cutting out as much fat as they can at least compared to every other school district in the state. The district, uh, let's see, its board has also advocated at the state level for policies that will provide relief, uh, financial relief, including reform of PERS. Beaverton is one of the few school districts where the school board has actually come out in favor of PERS reform. The district narrowly lost a levy election in two, November 2011, while other districts, including Lake Oswego, Tiger, Tualatin, have kept the levy option money flowing. This election provides a chance for the Beaverton School District voters to reverse the downward funding trend in their schools and to begin to invest once again in education. They should approve Measure 34204 with the knowledge that all the money raised will be spent in local classrooms for the benefit of local families. Um, it is true that uh, if passed, 100% of the levy funds go to prevent, uh, prevent cuts to classroom teaching positions. All funds from this late levy remain in the school district, none goes to Salem. Annual reports with a, with a, a, a citizen <coughs> oversight Excuse board me. made to the public about the use of the funds with the levy we can at least stop the cuts and add back some teachers. Without it, we will see more cuts. Um, uh, I've gone over my allotted time. I would be happy to entertain questions. Uh, I'll give you one question. Excellent. If, if somebody's got a quick question. In 2011, the levy failed. Part of the area that failed right around here. It was 60% against 44. Can you give me a reason why? Um, all the high schools right in the yeah. middle. Yeah, excellent question, and, and that's beyond my scope of knowledge on the subject. Um, it didn't lose by much. <clears throat> much of it's going to have to do, whether we are able to pass it this time, will have to do with voter turnout. Um, in 2011, uh, you may recall the headlines last year um, about a, 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 I think it was 400 positions were lost or something of that nature. Um, in 2011, it was we were we I say the people who were campaigning. It was not me. Was saying that these things are coming if we don't get this. It's different now. These things have happened. The reality is that classes are too large. Teachers are burning out. Um, and kids are not being taught. And that will have long-term consequences if that continues for the community. Um, people move to communities. When we talk, when you, if you sold a house or bought a house, one of the most common questions is how are the schools? People moving into a community want to know how the schools are. Um, people move to communities for the schools. And even if you do not have children or grandchildren in the Beaverton School District, it has an impact. It has an impact. I'm a self. Uh, I, I'm a small business owner. It has an impact on on the workforce and the quality of the workforce. The reason I bring the question up: We're going through a revitalization, revitalization study of below a rebuild, and 
they can't even vote for this school. Yeah. Well, hopefully this That's year. That's the point I'm bringing up. I appreciate <coughs> that. Hopefully this year, uh, we'll have more. So hopefully they do this time. What I'd like to do is, uh, can you make it super brief, a yes-no question, or 30 seconds or less? Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is be a conduit. And our, our mutual friend between uh, Mark and myself is, uh, uh, is Sally Sonic. Uh -huh. And that uh, if you guys have additional questions, I'd be happy to connect you with uh, Sally or Mark and have an offline conversation. Uh, but I want to shoehorn this in because they asked nicely, and I think it's really important. But... Uh, um, I also have got to keep a meeting moving along, which is my cue for a certain lieutenant named Ron Baker. Thank you. Um, Mark, thanks, thank you so much. How about some applause for Mark? I'm going to ask for double the applause for Ron Baker for a couple reasons, and that is um, one of our speakers from March uh, was a certain Donna Tyner, and I'm probably in clear violation of uh, HIPAA regulations by disclosing the fact that she showed up at uh, the fire station with something stuck in her throat, and they stabilized her and sent her to the emergency room. And, and then when I was helpless, not able to get into the room here, Ron pulled out a fire truck and came on over and unlocked the door, and I thought that was awesome. Thank you, Ron. Um, the floor is yours, and can you keep it to about five or ten, or just? It's, it's been kind of a slow month in the area. Kind of slow. Our station here, six two, has been pretty busy. We've had 324 calls since the last meeting last month, and uh, uh, it always seems like it. it Get real busy around Christmas time, then it slows down a little bit, and then summer ramps up and we get busy again. So our big safety uh, piece this time of year is uh, like outdoor barbecue safety. So uh, people are starting to pull out their barbecues, fire up their grills, and uh, we tend to see some more burns and house fires this time of year just due to that. So I, I love some flyers in the back. Please take one if you guys are active grillers and you're not familiar with some of your stuff this time of year. So be real careful out there, and then be careful with your kids around it. So it also talks about you know being safe with gasoline, mowing your lawns, uh, your edgers, those kind of things. Uh, we're also probably picking up those projects that now the weather's nice, staining the deck, cleaning the deck. So all those kind of uh, products are extremely flammable, and we, we again we see deck fires a lot pop up this time of year. So um, and then same thing with you know smoking and cigarette lighters, keep them keep them away from kids and uh, off. Uh, one of the gentlemen in the back brought up, a, he had a question for me about, have you guys heard about the Pulse Point app? Yeah. You better say yes. I was up here last month yeah, giving a whole speech. Yeah. Let me oh, ask no. your question. Has anybody downloaded it? Raise your hand if you've downloaded it. Give Two. Give a sticker, Ron. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, you Lisa can probably talk about it better than I can. But so anyway, what it is, it's an app for your smartphone where, and I think it's just for Washington County, is that right? For our service area. Okay, our service area. Where the if, Yeah. Uh, which, you know, we range from the low all the way over to West Lynn. So pretty wide swath of uh, Washington County and Clackamas. But uh, if there's a cardiac arrest in a public building, public space, uh, like it, I think even like a mall. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you will get it, uh, a notification on your phone, and then it will also tell you where like the nearest AED is located. So what we're finding within cardiac arrest is the sooner somebody can get on uh, somebody's chest and start chest compressions, or if, they, if, if they're available to be defibrillated, the better the, the long-term outcome is with them getting out of the hospital with full brain function. So uh, it's, it's kind of a neat little tech thing that actually helps in the real world and uh, can actually save some lives. So if you have a smartphone and uh, you, you know how to push on somebody's chest or do CPR, it's a, it's a valuable app. So uh, that's about all I got for you today. It's pretty sweet and simple this time of year. You have so, two questions? Yes. Uh, my question is how do you get the app? It, it should be free. You can go to our website, tbfr.com, and uh, there'll be a, there's a little talking point right on the, the front of the webpage. And then uh, I'm assuming you can just uh, get it from like your, your app, app store. App store. Yeah. So type in just type in point. Pulse point. We'll give you a list of uh, fire agencies to choose from, and we'll be in that list because it's in several agencies now. Mm -hmm. um, tell them how it got started, Ron. I actually don't okay. remember that part. It was designed by the fire chief in San Ramon, who
who uh, was out to dinner one evening and um, found out the next day that there was cardiac arrest in the dining room next to where he was. And he could have saved someone's life had he known. And to him, he said, that will never happen again. And so those guys are smart down there. And they wrote this app that um, uses GPS and, and uh, works right through the 911 system. So they actually get the tap right at the same time you would get the tap on your phone. Sometimes you have to pull Yeah, it's been a few faster. seconds faster, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but he is right, those first few minutes, as I said last time, are crucial to survivability and to a good outcome. And I have two that happened within three weeks at Washington Square, um, where bystander CPR was given, AED was used, and we, I'm gonna say we have two good outcomes from that. So how, how many people in here are CPR trained? A lot. Not currently. So I mean, it's it completely so. changed uh, in the past ten years. It's more on uh, chest compressions than it is giving mouth to mouth. Way easier. So it's, yeah. it's so much easier than it, than it ever was. So those little plastic <coughs> pieces they used to make you buy and put over the mouth, they don't even we don't even recommend those anymore. It's all compressions. So you don't have to count. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, this 15 <coughs> to 16 3 whatever they go. kept changing it so no more of that they don't have to do any of that a lot easier yeah. any other questions I, oh yeah check your smoke detector batteries <coughs> i got the last question could we give some applause to ron baker <laughs> thank you sir um at the risk of being a, a bully um this is a round table discussion. We have we have a C table discussion. If I'm going to start grabbing people and parking you if you don't move, <laughs> and uh, and I, I may have some hooks come out of the deputies and potential sergeants or any other high ranking folks, and so if you, you can move over there. And they don't bite. They, they, well, they do, but that's part of the fun. So <laughs> round out the table. Come on, citizens first. I'll take yeah, the last. Sure. Seat okay, you can hide in the corner. Um, uh, Deputy Whitley or uh, Whitley? Yes. Whitley. Okay. I just want to make sure I got your rank correct. Come on up. And then the other guy, I think, went to my high school. But that's Actually, okay. Deputy Whiteley did, too. R what year did you graduate uh, Aloha? 87. Really? 85? Wow. And uh, Anthony, you were 80, 88? Uh, how many other people are Aloha <laughs> alumni here? Yeah, we won't get into that. Uh-oh, uh OK. <laughs> uh, Deputy, give us an update. Yeah, first off, I would apologize. We were running a little behind on things, so I do not have the Selected Property Crime Report. Uh, within the last week, with the weather changing, what we see in a couple of things, like to caution you guys on, the warmer weather is going to bring out people later at night, and it's going to be tempting for you to roll around with your car windows rolled down, enjoying the weather, and then leave it parked with a window cracked or something like that. So I just want to encourage you guys, we see a lot of theft of opportunity where people are just out uh, in the warmer nights going around and just checking doors, checking windows, checking doors, checking windows. So make sure you're securing your vehicles. Make sure if you've got your windows open to let cool air in, that you've got a bar in place or something so it's not just an easy end for people. So just be aware of that and just be aware of the, the warmer weather. I mean, school's still in session, which is a great thing, but that will end eventually too, as all those parents know. And uh, we'll have a lot more folks running around late at night. So just, just use some common sense or precautionary. And unfortunately, like I said again, I, I don't have any updated reports for you guys tonight. I've got a couple updates, and we'll see if there's any questions for Deputy Whitley, who works this district all the time. First of all, we have a good partnership with the Little Business Association. I know we've got a couple members here. Uh, in the last couple months, we partnered up with uh, one of the, the businesses that had a adopt the road section, 198 between basically Baseline and uh, <coughs> Highway or Johnson. Uh, they had to clean up the road. There were some blackberries and stuff that were overgrown. One thing that we're able to do with the sheriff's office, we bring out jail work crews. And so we brought out a jail work crew to work with the citizens that were cleaning uh, that part of the roadway. The jail inmates kind of started one side where it was really thick overgrown with blackberry bushes and we started cleaning that up. Uh, and they kind of worked on a collaborative effort on getting that cleaned up. So I think it was a good partnership and uh, turned out really well. We're kind of continuing that partnership in some other areas <coughs> with Beaverton School District and Colton Hills Parks and Rec. Uh, there's that expansion going on to Mountain View Middle School, the park. It's been there for quite some time. We've had problems with some people kind of hanging out. They're not, you know, kind of transient type folks and kids partying back there. So we're working together jointly on how we can clean up some of those areas, maybe clear some of the brush, 
potentially with inmate workers again, uh, but then also to make sure our deputies are out there kind of doing some extra patrols around there, especially as, like Deputy Whiteley said, summer's getting here, the warm weather that's gonna entice more kids and, and folks that shouldn't be staying out in the park, you know, until all hours to be out there. So don't hesitate to call us if you guys see any of that stuff or having those problems. And then in addition to the, uh, the crime data, all of our crime data is available online now. So if you go to the Sheriff's Office website, I can bring the website back uh, next time. But you can click on your neighborhood and it'll show any calls for service that have gone on in that area. I don't know, is everybody aware of that? It's a fairly new thing, we started this last year. Uh, the one thing to remember is they're not actually uh, coded correctly always. So if I call in a, a suspicious person and then the deputies get there and it's actually a stolen car, uh, <laughs> it doesn't always get uh, reclassified. So it's whatever the call comes in as. So sometimes it might seem a little more egregious than it is, uh, or sometimes it's a little underplayed. But and where, where can we get that? You can get that on the Sheriff's Office website. I believe there's a link through there. I have oh, not gotten, we'll fire it up. Well, I have not gotten into it, so I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen the link, but I'm not sure exactly how to get into it. But I can get the exact website for you next time if you'd like. Well, Google. lately you talk. Coke, come over here. Well, we'll fire. <laughs> And then I want, I got a question. Yes, sir. You did a cell phone sting around 185th and TV Highway. That may or may not be true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who got stung? Now, do you know anything about that? Uh, I did the, so anytime we get a detail like that, that's typically run by our traffic team. It's primarily going to be the, the gentlemen you see on the motorcycles. They run a lot of the uh, traffic stings, things like that. That does bring up another point is obviously, like he's mentioning, Talking on your cell phone, just so you understand what the verbiage of the ordinance is, is it's got to be a hands-free device, okay? So put it on speakerphone and set it the cup holder, good to go. Put it on speakerphone and hold it like this while you drive, that would get you pulled over. Uh, Bluetooth feed, Bluetooth speaker, some of your best bets, some of your best ways to go. Uh, but yeah, any any detail like that is typically run by the traffic team. They accumulate all the, all the stats for that, so I don't have that. Could you tell me where all the Beaverton photo radar trucks would be? <laughs> you know, I have a really odd question, and I, my husband has a car that he bought that came with manufactured tinting, not aftermarket tinting, and Beaverton police have pulled him over at least two or three times now. The last time he was pulled over. The officer had some kind of gadget that measured. So I called Washington County last or a few days ago to say, okay, how do we get a certification so he's not hassled all the time? Because he didn't, this is the way the car came. And so the officer I talked with with Beaverton said, oh, go to the dealership. And by the way, there's some law that says you have to carry some piece of paper certification in your glove compartment box. So Herzog Meyer didn't know about it. Then they sent me over to some tinting shop that does this, that does Herzog Meyer, and they didn't know about it. Is this some ex obscure? So, again, this is probably more for the traffic guys, but from what I understand is the documentation you're talking about, the tint certification, that's really designed more to cover the place that did the tinting than to cover you because uh, things like license plate covers, any, any kind of the tinted covers you see that people put over the license plate, it's against the law of the state of Oregon that anything over the surface of your license plate that doesn't stop people from selling them and people installing them and dealership installing them. The same way that tinting your windows to a certain degree of darkness, mm -hmm. it's a, allowed to be sold in the state, it's allowed to be done, and typically they sign a certificate saying, yeah, we tinted this, but it doesn't mean it's within the legal ratio of tint. Right, but the car is within the legal. He's just tired of getting stopped and wants to be able to whip out certification that says it's under the 30 or 35 percent. Yeah, as far as I know, you would have to contact the place that did the tinting originally because no one else is going to want to take. Right, but it came. It was a manufacturer. We're pretty sure it's a manufacturer. Generally, it's not. Most manufacturers don't tint their windows to those dark. Mm, that's not what Herzog Meyer told us. What kind of car is it? It's a Jetta, Volkswagen Jetta. Yeah, unless it was manufactured for outside of the area potentially. Okay. I'll touch on the crime data really quick. So if you go to the sheriff's office website, uh, Washington County Sheriff's Office. Uh, just come down the side, you'll see crime reports. Go ahead and click on that, and then it'll take you over to uh, another page. So this is a, a private company that a lot of law enforcement agencies throughout the state, uh, Portland Police, ourselves, and some other folks, utilize. Uh, 
And so if you just put type in your address, you'll see these calls, and you can go ahead and click on them. So it'll be, uh, you know, a theft, and it'll give you kind of the basic address. Uh, it doesn't give you all of when you. It won't give you all of the details of the call. Theft from vehicles. Those are kind of the big ones. Like uh, Deputy Whiteley was saying, as we get in the summertime, those are always what we're looking at. We actually have crime analysts that use more up-to-date maps that they'll print these out for us, and so our sergeants, our deputies can look at it and say, okay, we're having a bunch of people breaking the cars over at 198th and Rock. And so we can start focusing our patrols over there and try to catch the people that are doing it. But this gives you an opportunity to get on there and, and look throughout the county. Now, some jurisdictions aren't using this, so, uh, but for the sheriff's office, we are. If it's an unincorporated Washington County uh, call, you can see that. And again, be, just be aware, like I said, just because it has a specific call type doesn't mean that's exactly what it is. And if you get to the sheriff's office, either our east precinct or our west precinct, you might see a big balloon of a bunch of calls uh, a lot of those are like sexual assault and type calls because we code those just to our office because there's a lot of personal information we don't want out in, to different neighborhoods. Uh, just mainly because if we have uh, certain crimes, we don't want the victims to be uh, kind of at risk at that. So, any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. So, I was out of town last week and had a house sitter. Yes. Little girl and. Um, Sunday midnight-ish, she heard somebody trying the door, the windows, trying to get through the gate, so she called, two deputies came out, um, but she okay. doesn't know their names, I don't know what they found, and I want to talk to somebody about it, of course it doesn't show up on here no, because they didn't find anybody, no. but um, so how do I know who I'm supposed to call and why don't they leave a business card, because I know our uh, guys do. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It just depends on the circumstances. Uh, all of our deputies have business cards. It just depends on what it is. If it's something like you, know, like you s talked about, where they maybe don't have an actual crime, they're going to get right out and start looking for people that might be in the neighborhood doing those types of things. You can always call the sheriff's office and ask to speak to the deputy and ask what occurred. Uh, I'll give you my card as well. Okay. Feel free to Does email I, me the information yeah. and we can find out where the call I didn't was. know who it was, and then yeah. I wondered, is this happening to more than just my house? Yeah. So is this are, something we need to be aware of? Can I do one more thing real quick? I was oh, going to try to link to geopolicing. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to well, I'll let you do that if you want. So right. if you, you can jump in because I couldn't find it. So. Uh, it's under, I believe, fighting crime, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe not. But there's, we do have a link that shows uh, on the Sheriff's Office website. Oh, it's who patrols my neighborhood, right here. So if you come over to this link over here on the side, click on this. Uh, click on who patrols my neighborhood and what the way the sheriff's office works is we have uh, beats all over the sheriff's office so here in Aloha we've got four different beats we've got two in kind of south of TV highway and two north of TV highway if you zoom in and click on those it'll actually give you uh, the information of the sergeant that oversees your beat so what the way we work is we've got a sergeant assigned to every beat that tracks all ongoing criminal activity so if you guys think about like Rio's ribs there's been the old Rio's ribs. There's been some graffiti up there. Our sergeant that works that district constantly is working with the property owners to make sure that stuff gets cleaned up and kind of going through some of that code enforcement type stuff. Uh, so it's really important for us. If you have any of those questions, don't ever hesitate to uh, get in there. And it'll so depending on where you live, it'll pop up uh, the sergeant. And then when you email the sergeant, it goes to the sergeant, the lieutenant, and myself, generally speaking. Uh, but at least they can get back to you and let you know. This is what was going on, this is what we found, this is what we didn't find. So don't ever hesitate to contact the sergeant that oversees your beat. That's what they're there for. Uh, our sergeants bid for precincts according to seniority and days off. They, they stay with their beats for long term. Hmm. So it doesn't matter where they work. We want to keep that continuity for long term problem solving, working with the businesses, working with the, the communities. A lot of the CPOs, a lot of the different uh, neighborhood associations, we want them to be able to know who to contact. So If I could jump in and add yes, to sir. that. This is a really good tool uh, to use because if you're afraid to call but still want to get information or fish for information, when you click that, you're sharing some information. So you're saying who you are, but what this allows is like a sergeant who's over, overseeing deputies in a beat to get information from a whole bunch of deputies. So they can kind of, as management, connect the dots and so see if there's uh, somebody jiggling door handles two days earlier yeah. on two streets over and then kind of pull things together. For me, this is great because a lot of times you, as my constituents, ask me to get stuff done, and this is what I do behind the scenes. Like, you call me up at home, and I'm like typing, and it's like, and then I get a response two or three days later, or I just connect the dots between your email and the sergeant's email. 
What this does is, is respectful on their workload and their time, and you're not pulling a beat deputy off of a, you know, a, a, an active call. You're letting the sergeant manipulate a workload that's appropriate, and you pay for this. So this is not only a great way to uh, figure out what's going on if you got a problem, but just kind of do it the right way, and as opposed to tying up their phones, lets them just kind of work through emails, which is when they have time to do it, works great. So th that's what I've heard. Would, would that be a correct assessment no. from you guys on the street? Is yeah, that without a doubt. You know, our goal with the sheriff's office is to keep our beat deputies in the beat. So that's what we try to maximize. Uh, and our sergeants are able to track long-term problems. And you know, when you look at the crime data maps, like I said, we've got more accurate ones that they're getting, the sergeants are getting on a weekly basis to show all the main crimes in their area. And that's what they're doing. They're tracking that stuff. If they, let's say it's a bunch of cars that are being broken into, They'll get work with uh, property crimes detectives, maybe do some different missions to make sure we're out there looking. Our deputies that are working in the middle of the night go out there. If they stop somebody walking through your neighborhood at 3 o'clock in the morning, they document that information. Uh, and then we can go back through and say, well, you know, this person was walking through your neighborhood at 3 o'clock in the morning. Maybe they were out there doing something that they weren't supposed to if they lived over in southeast Portland, for instance. So uh, just all the way that we put those pieces together to try to solve a lot of those crimes. So don't ever hesitate to call us or email us because we never know when it's that missing piece of the puzzle. So it's really important for us. Any last questions? I have one. Dick. Just as an aside, if I'm in, in a dedicated turn lane, do I have to use my turn signal? Yes. Yes. That's awesome. Thank you. I Did I not do that on the way in here? Are you following me? <laughs> <laughs> and one, just one other quick thing I have when you mentioned being on vacation, something that all of you should know about is if you plan on going out of town for a prolonged period with summer travel, uh, whatever you got on plan, you can always call the non-emergency number and you can say, hey, this is so-and-so, this is my address, I'm going to be leaving Friday night, I'm going to be gone for two weeks, can you notify the deputies that work that area? They'll put out what we call an after patrol request. That request says, hey, there shouldn't be anybody at this house, the homeowner's going to board, there's going to be a house sitter there, but she's only there two hours a day or whatever. And then that gets disseminated to all the cars in the area that work to be. And then we can bring up the stuff and go say, oh, I'm going to drive by this house and take a look at it. So it's another way just to be proactive okay. before you head out of town. Yeah, because she was just a little young thing. They're lucky I went home. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? No. Yes, sir. Yes, I have one more. Um, I noticed we have warm weather coming along. Um, I've been following a number of cars. And for some reason or other, um, People driving seem to think it's a good idea to put your arm out the window and cool off. And so when they do that, they're they're really signaling the churn. And and uh, I I don't even know if they know that. Yeah. Because we all have turn signals, but so I see that happen all the time, and I just. I, yeah, I you know that's generally that. something not our, our deputies aren't going to enforce that. You know, if somebody doesn't use their turn signals, if and they didn't use an arm signal, they might enforce that. But you know, again. I know most of us have probably been guilty about that at times, and so in this day and age, unless you know somebody in a bike, we're going to look at that type of stuff on a bicycle or a motorcycle without lights. But most cars that have them are required to have them. Uh, so if they didn't, that might be something they might be stopped for. How about some applause for our deputies? <laughs> guys, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. You guys have really done a great job continuing to support our program. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's uh, some political talent in the room that's gunning for my position. And about a year ago, this guy started uh, by schmoozing a congresswoman with flowers and certificates. And his name's Zachary Jarvis. And, oh, yes, uh, Mr. Zachary. And Zachary has done a couple really neat things, uh, uh, including setting out a table and fundraising, selling uh, uh, dog biscuits and brownies. I think I, I get, got suckered into the brownies um, uh, right there in a, uh, on uh, 174th in order to raise money for the Aloha Community Library. And so he has done a number of entrepreneurial things, uh, uh, and I think he's about to announce one more. Would you like to tell us what you're doing to support the library? Mm -hmm. I'm selling popcorn for a dollar. Her, me, and it helps fundraise the uh, library. Me, and it's going to get doubled by a generous donor. Would you sell me one? <laughs> well, work it over. <laughs> I would suggest you follow my example and give the man some money and buy some popcorn because he's uh, uh, commencing with alchemy and doubling the money. 
and that stays in, in our little neck of the woods. And uh, as I see our president, who's just arrived, Mr. Doug Foy, you wanna wave? Um, we are um, uh, doing some really neat things, and probably the one that Doug should be bragging about, but I'm gonna steal his thunder, is that uh, we've become an employer, and that we've been creating jobs. And I think that in this economy, that there's some bragging rights for all the volunteers, and not only Becky, but Martin Granham has stepped up to the plate from, from the very beginning, and sat in through some really long, nauseating sa sausage-making sessions to get our Articles of Incorporation and 501c3 nonprofit status in play. And uh, it, the community spoke, said, we want a library. And the doors are open. And opened at 12 hours a week, and then 15, and now 29. We've got honest to God employees and an employee identification number and bills to pay. So um, buy some popcorn, people. Um, with that being said, I think it's time to set the table for um, a roundtable discussion. And um, I'm pleased that about a year ago, um, then Mayor Dirksen said, um, yeah, I'll come on down. We had a candidate for him. And uh, he ran unopposed and became our uh, Metro Councilor. And with some redistricting, he's uh, taking care of business south of TV Highway. And with the attention the Aloha Reed Bill study and TV Highway studies uh, is garnished in the community and Metro's involvement, it was high time that not only did we have uh, the Councilor back out, but we had some discussions that uh, were centric on what's going on. and. Uh, but I didn't want this to be a top-down discussion. I wanted this to be a people discussion. So I'm going to kind of moderate a little bit. And if you wax on like I just did, I'm going to pull out some signs and flag you down, <laughs> cut you off. Um, <laughs> I've had the sign. You, you've been you given the sign? I've been given the one. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh, but with that being said, I, I kind of want to uh, turn it over for maybe uh, starting out with a brief up. How, you know, how about some mm -hmm. applause for the guy to come out and, and enjoy the questions? Uh, Councillor Dirksen. you want to turn that off and, and um, re-encourage people who may have just come in to sit? That's a good idea. Sit around the table. Round table and not uh, in the back. I really appreciate Eric setting it up this way. Um, I know that some sometimes uh, elected officials and others, when they come and meet with citizen groups, uh, they, they come with a prepared statement and they like to stand at the lectern and, and, and talk to you. and. Uh, that's not my style. I, I'd rather not come and, and talk at you. I would rather talk with you and listen to you. And uh, uh, so I appreciate this kind of in a circle where we can chat together and look each other in the eye. Uh, that's more my style. Now, and I want to apologize for even dressing as formally as I did. We had a council meeting today. We had two public hearings and uh, a business meeting. So. And, and then I came straight here from it. So normally, I would try to go home first and change into my neighborhood clothes. But, uh, <laughs> but I didn't have a, a chance today. But I did take the jacket off. I would loosen my tie, but my, my, uh, my host <laughs> still has his all cinched up. But with your permission, I would be happy to I'll, do that. We, we do the tandem. <laughs> <laughs> come off if, uh, if you feel more comfortable. <laughs> great, great. Um, well, I'd like to give you a rundown on a few things that, that Metro is going to be working on this year. And then I do want to talk to you and primarily listen to you as I learn more about the TV highway plan and the Aloha Reedville plan. Because I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know a lot about them. Those were going on before I was on council and even the person from my district wasn't the representative to those. So, there's not a lot of, of, uh, of knowledge got passed on there. Um, but, uh, but I can start with some of the things that, that I am more familiar with, and then we can talk about that. I know one of the things that I heard that would like to be discussed is kind of a comparison between um, the, the TV highway study and the Southwest Corridor study, which is essentially the Barber Boulevard 99W uh, corridor, which is, a, which is a metro study uh, as the mayor of Tigard, I sat on that uh, before I was elected to Metro, and now as a Metro councilor, I'm the co-chair, so I know quite a bit about that. Um, but we can talk about that maybe last and then fold into the, from there into the TV highway study. Uh, one of the other things that I've been working on, I was appointed by the uh, president to be the liaison from Metro, is uh, the Climate Smart Communities Program. And I don't, how many of you even have heard of that know what that is? Climate Smart Communities. Okay. Uh, if you remember in, I think, 2009, uh, the state legislature 
raise the gas tax for like the first time since 1964 or something. And that was to raise more money for road improvements, road maintenance and whatnot. Uh, when that passed, to get that passed through the legislature, there was a condition placed on it that 